Hey, it's Zach reminding you to download and subscribe to the ESPN Daily Podcast with the great Mina Kimes. On Monday's episode, she talked to Minnesota Timberwolves head coach Ryan Saunders. You can find ESPN Daily wherever you get your podcasts. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast on a Monday afternoon. And I am honored to be joined uh, for this conversation by uh, the head coach of the Detroit Pistons, the former head coach of the, both the Toronto Raptors and the Minnesota Timberwolves, Mr. Dwayne Casey. How are you? Doing great. How are you doing, Zach? Hanging in. It's all we can do. It's been my stock. It's been my stock answer to that question for years. And now it is like strangely ap- It was pessimistic before. And now it's apropos. Just hanging in. That's it. There you go. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. So obviously, you know, I had a um, I had a podcast scheduled for today where Ken, Kevin Arnovitz and I were going to pick our all defense teams for the year. And sometime around Saturday, it became clear that wasn't going to be appropriate, and that wasn't it doesn't matter, and it's not the conversation that matters. And so I reached out to you, and you were kind enough to give me some time to talk about the conversation that that does matter. Um, you released a very eloquent statement over the weekend through the Pistons about. Um, having grown up in Kentucky, having integrated your own elementary school and heard the N-word thrown at you, seen the Klan, uh, you know, try to run Dick Gregory out of town when he was speaking there and how, I don't know what the right word is, how depressing, alarming, predictable, maybe all of them, it was for you to see um, George Floyd killed at the hands of the police officers. And, and we've had three or four of of, of those kind of deaths in the last month. And, and so I just wanted to ask you when you're watching that and then you're watching the protests all around the country, everywhere. Um, what is it, what has it been like for you and your family this weekend? Well, you know, again, Zach, it brought up a lot of emotions. You know, I, I can remember like it was yesterday going to school that first day of school, that first week of school and how afraid I was. I, I was so afraid and, you know, I felt like, you know, I, I wasn't supposed to be here, but I'm here uh, walking through the, the people, the parents out front with the signs in their hands. Uh, and then I look at my son the next morning and 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 just see what is he what is he going to be going through? What is his world going to be like? Because I knew what mine was like. It, it was a fight every day uh, after being called the N word. And, you know, until kids got to know me as a person that I was a human being and not an animal. Then we became friends. Then we became teammates. And to this day, Zach, some of those same guys are my friends today. And so there is a positive in that. Uh, But I I just often wonder how much we've come, how far we've come since then, just by looking at today's happenings with Brianna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, Ahmaud Aubrey in, in Georgia, some of those are just senseless executions and, and we might as well say it, uh, you know, murders. And uh, just to see it on video brought back a lot of those emotions, emotions of fear, emotions of, of not, uh, not being, help, being helpless in those situations. And so, you know, I sit down and just try to put pen to paper and my grammar wasn't, my grammar wasn't perfect, but my story was, was uh, was coming out, and before you know it, I was telling my life story at that time, and and er- eerily, it's it's similar to what it is today. You have a a twelve year old daughter and a nine year old son. Um, did have you already talked to them about this topic before this, and, or, and did you revisit it this weekend? And and what is the content of those conversations in your household? Well, it's it's a little different with both of them, and I, I hope that we as parents can can have the same conversations in the same way because uh, my, my son, he has Chaldean friends. He has white friends. He has black friends. Uh, and to him, to they're just, um, they're Nerf gun buddies. You know, they're, they're playing buddy. That's all they are. He doesn't care what color it goes. Up until a few years ago, Zach, uh, we always told our kids, well, there's light skinned kids. There's blind kids. There's 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 uh, brown kids. We didn't use the word black and white because I think it's at some point in ki- kids' early development they start looking at black is bad and white is good, and so we tried to do it in that way, Zach, just to trying to educate them uh, with my my son. 
and also my daughter until she got old enough to understand. So now I talk to her about, you know, being an African American young lady and participating in sports is a is a privilege. It's a privilege that I didn't have up until like the third or fourth grade, fifth grade, to play and organize baseball, basketball. Uh, we, you know, that we couldn't play. So, you know, so she understands that. But again, like I tell my son, there's no difference between you and 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 whoever me. Uh, we both bleed blood. We breathe the same air. Uh, but it's what we teach our kids and how we try to be. Uh, sensitive of what we say, our actions toward other people, our actions to people, um, and and where they because they pick up on everything. They mm-hmm. pick up on how you feel about Muslims, uh, Catholics, or they're they're listening and watching. So that's what our job is as parents uh, have to understand when we're raising our kids, and hopefully that generation will go on and have that attitude and and approach to, to their friends and mankind. Have you talked to them about police and what happens if you're going five miles an hour over the speed limit, by the way, which I do every time I drive and you get pulled over? Have you had that conversation yet? I, I've had that conversation in a joking way with my son because he's a little bit more stoneheaded. Uh, you, know, he's, he, you know, you tell him to do something, he's going to do the opposite. So I told him, I said, look, if you, once you get your driver's license, when police pull you over, you're not in charge. You're not in charge. You're not going to tell him what you're going to do. Be respectful. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. If you got to get your license, oh, Dad, I know that. Okay, I just so it's kind of lighthearted with him, and she's sitting there listening. So hopefully she picks it up. But uh, had that kind of light, lighthearted but serious conversation with him because I think it's important. I think it's, it's sad that we have to do that, but uh, I think it's important. I read an interview with you uh, from two years ago, I think in the Toronto star where someone asked you where the columnist asked you, have any of your players ever asked you about segregation? And you said, no, mm-hmm. and because you, which you, which you lived through and you said, no, not once. Yeah. And so I wonder um, in the wake of, of George Floyd and, and everything else, have you had conversations with your players? Maybe not about segregation, but about this. Right. I have, we're going to have a, a team meeting tomorrow night. We got a zoom set up. We have a special uh, set up with all the medical people, training staff, because I think it's important to for everybody to understand and, and get a feel, to understand how I feel, how Blake Griffin may feel, how who, uh, other teammates may feel about what's going on today. And But the next question, the next thing is, you know, what can we do? What action are we going to take to help? It may be something small, but let's do something to take a step forward. It may be what you teach your kids. It may be going to speak at an elementary, whatever it is, let's do something to, to really continue the conversation of change. Uh, my thing is here is I, I got a call into the police chief is trying to combine the police league, summer basketball league in with our Pistons Academy to try to get the young police officers, the trainees, uh, who are going through the training to understand what's a good policeman, a bad policeman, to understand and have empathy for people and not be dumb. Yes, protect yourself and, you know, enforce the law. But yet and still, this young man here, he may have a different skin color, but he's a kid. He's a he's a good kid from a good family, possibly. So those are the things that we're going to try to create here in Detroit, which has been hard hit economically. Uh, has had a history of riots, and so those are the things that we're going to try to to, to try to preach here. Um, I'm glad you used the word empathy because I want to talk a lot about that later. But but first, I, I want to ask you. You know, you talked about doing something, and I wonder if having written that statement about your childhood and today, feeling like you've lived this this moment so many times, if you feel cynical that this is ever going to change, or I mean, to me, I'm I'm 42. I'm younger than you, and I'm we have much different backgrounds and all that. Just, this does feel different. The widespread nature of this, I don't think it's going to stop with the end of the weekend. It's everywhere, and and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Are you cynical? Are you or or are you hope? Are you in a way hopeful that this does feel like something more monumental is happening? Zach, that is a great question. I, you know. When it first happened, I was cynical. I said, here we go again. 
what the heck is going on? But as it's going on, as I hear people talk, as I watch, these riots are not just African-American kids. These are all walks of life, female, white, brown, uh, whatever, whatever walk of life, you see them marching. Uh, unfortunately, you see some of them doing the violence and all that, which is wrong. But this is different. Usually before you would see all African-American people marching. but And that's what it's going to take, Zach. Uh, again, you just said it, we're born to different parents. And it's, you're never going to feel the way I feel. I'm never going to feel the way you feel about things because of our way we're raised. But it's going to take the majority. It's going to take the majority, whatever that majority is, to create change. You know, whether it's the, 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 the good-hearted white people or whatever the majority is in your circumstance, in your area, that's what's going to create change because, uh, you know, we've been marching, people have been marching and fighting for change for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And maybe a little bit has changed. And, and, and in, in some people's eyesight, there's big changes. And, and, and probably opportunity has been big change, but not enough. When you still see the Ahmaud Arbery's and the, and the George Floyd's and, and Breonna Taylor's go down the way they do and some of the other systematic uh, racism that's still around us. So, uh, but the one thing that everybody can do, one thing everybody can do, Zach, is to listen, actively listen. You're not a racist, nowhere even close. But, you know, some people feel guilty about what can I do? And I think everybody can just listen, listen to what those folks are saying in Minneapolis, listen not just hear them talk to you, listen to what they're saying and how they're saying and try to process it in our, in your feelings and inside of whatever you, your, your reality is uh, to try to try to put it together. And I think that's so important because so many years, you know, people have heard the same words and that's where, like you said, that's where the cynical feelings come from. They've heard those same things before. So I want to take that in two directions. The first of the first of thing is I think one of the reasons that ev- that you are have felt cynical and that many of us have felt cynical is that these problems seem so big that they are impossible. It's similar to climate change. Like I feel if I really wanted to fight climate change, um, like the future of Earth where we live, uh, I would have to like quit my job to do it because I just don't have time. And 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 you know, you can write a check for 50 bucks here and a hundred bucks here. And then it just sort of like, okay, I've done my job. And like, that's not, a, that's not enough. And so I thought Obama wrote a, a great essay today where he, where he, he, I think he correctly sensed that helplessness. And he said, okay, let's drill down. You, everybody lives somewhere. Mm-hmm. Start there. Start mm-hmm. with, is there a police review board? Because the history of, of, is it elected? Who's running for those elections? Go to a city council meeting. I, I started in journalism covering lots of local issues, including courts and crime and police. I would go to city council meetings. There'd be nobody there. They're all open to the public. There's nobody there. And they're passionate debates about policy. Those people are picking critical, critical officials that affect how your community works. Your mayor, all of those things. I, I thought that was really, you know, President Obama's Barack Obama, he could, he could have said anything, and he, he has a way with language and words for him to come out and say, you know what, forget all the fancy stuff. Right. Where do you live? Drill down there. I thought that was really useful advice. It kind of made me like that's actually that, – that is a way of making it feel manageable. And if enough people make it feel manageable in their local communities, that's how you start to get the right people elected. That's how you start to get actual change being made. No question, Zach. And that's kind of where going to the police station here uh, and affecting change with the tra- trainees, trying to affect policy. But like you said, the elected officials, the elected sheriff, the elected, you know, the, who are they? We get as a police chief. Uh, but again, understanding policy, how to affect change within the policy, because some people's hearts, you're never going to change. But where you, we can change is like you said, Go to these meetings, have a voice, uh, you know, have have a plan, have a plan of action once you go there. Just don't go there with a lot of venom and, and, and frustration, but have a plan. Here's what we need to do. Here is the policy we need to change and uh, simplify it that way. And like 
President Obama said, do it locally. Do it with maybe get it even lower than that. Do it in your neighborhood. You know, local. Maybe you know, for us out here in the suburb, let's let's do it here. Do it in downtown Detroit. Do it in Birmingham. Do it in Troy. Wherever it is, let's do it locally in each of those areas, whether it's in Chicago, Indianapolis, Cleveland, wherever it is, let's take those. Because like you said, that's manageable. To sit here and say we're going to change the whole United States, that's that's that seems too, too big. And so uh, that's very, very important to think that way. But again, I'm going to say this. It's going to take the majority singing that same song in those small small meetings. I can go there and throw the hammer down 15 times. And I think that's why, you know, it's very important on our NABC committee to have Pop uh, and also Steve Kerr uh, on that committee. If it was just myself, Doc, uh, Nate, you, people just going to say there's some old angry black men <laughs> trying to do the same thing over again. So, again, you got to have good men with good hearts like Steve and Pop uh, leading the charge in that situation. And, and well-meaning people fail to participate locally, not through any failing of their own, not because they don't care. It's because they have families and jobs. And the idea of going to a city council right. meeting at nine o'clock at night right. is untenable to them. And I think the status quo, I think, to some degree depends on people opting out because they feel like they don't have time and finding Finding a way to have a little bit of time, finding one little mini thing, I, I think is a very important, like a manageable way in, like you said, because that, that if everyone's just like, oh, I can't do it, I can write a $50 check, like it, that's, it just doesn't work. That's so true. And, and again, it, it starts, like you said, at home. And that's the message I'm going to have with our players, whether you live in L.A., whether you live in, in uh, Louisiana, doesn't matter, Florida, in your local area you know, put a step forward and try to make a change. And, and that'll be a big help. Um, you, your, your point about the white coaches um, being on the committee and the importance of that, right. you know, um, I'm a white guy. I cover the NBA, right? Yeah. yeah. I think we've reached the point where when you say it's important for the majority to be involved, you know, I, again, a statement here, a speech there, whatever. That's right. not really involvement. Right. No. Um, it's hard to know how, but I, I think one of the important things is everybody in the – this the, the NBA is a family and it's a community. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we've reached a point where for people covering the NBA, mm-hmm. including me, right. it's not enough to just write the news story that Jalen Brown went to Atlanta – and protested and here are a couple quotes from Jalen Brown and here are a couple quotes from Malcolm Brogdon and leave it there. Mm-hmm. It's not enough to retweet, you know, what Don Staley wrote today in the Players Tribune. All of those things I think imply support. That's mm-hmm. implied support. I just don't think that's enough no. anymore. And and because th- this this issue it police police brutality and what we've all been talking about, it transcends class. It affects your players. It affects your coaches. Sterling Brown just had a case of it in Milwaukee. He got tased, I believe, for essentially Cephalosha. Cephalosha. In New York, yeah. Um, it's to me, it's now part of the beat. It's part of the beat. It's part of these players' stories, and it's part of the job of covering the NBA. And it has to just. It. I don't quite know. Because my job is always going to be mostly what happened in the game. What's right. the react? Who got traded? Like that's always going to be most of the job. So I don't quite know how to integrate it fully. Mm-hmm. But I think the the white media in particular covering the NBA mm-hmm. j- just has to do better than the implied support. Forget if you, if you don't if you don't if you're somehow not empathetic or sympathetic. I don't know what you're doing covering the NBA. Right. But I I just. I'm I'm sort of confused about I'm not confused but I I'm interested in day to day what that looks like but I, I just think we've we've got to do more than implied support it's not enough no question well one thing Zach there's no playbook for it you know you may handle it different than than Pop or Steve or or and I tell you somebody else Stan Van Gundy's doing a heck of a job of of behind the scenes working with different uh, player unions and the uh, the police union. Uh, all those type of things. But again, you know, unfortunately, those some of the coaches have time to do that. That's the other thing you just said. It, it takes time. And it's going to take time for 
guys like, you know, Pop and Steve and, and Stan to put into working with police unions, you know, and for me here to try to work with the police unions. So those are the things that uh, that are important is not only just talking about it, but getting involved in policy change with the police union. Uh, and, and just those things are, are so important. And that's some of the things that we talked about the other day that we can get involved in. And uh, But again, part of it, and we talked about it too, everybody's going to be down in, in uh, Orlando uh, together. You're going to have all the NBA media there. Let's, let's use that as a platform to talk about it, continue to talk about it. There's not a lot you can do there because you're going to be stuck in a bubble. But, you know, it probably, you know, you're still going to get the word out until you get out and get it back into the community when we get back to normal to be able to uh, affect change by going and do things. But as much as we can use your voice, another thing you didn't mention, you know, I'm going to get criticized for speaking out, you know, some of the hateful things on the social media that people said, you know, teach your son not to use a, a fake $20 bill, teach your son not to be a thug. So, you know, but again, I don't care. I don't care, Zach, because I'm old. I'm I'm on my last on the other side of the mountain. And if I can leave something to help by having this platform to speak out, I want to do it. I mean, it's beyond this is beyond basketball. Basketball is very, very important because that's what allows us to pay the bills and all that. But beyond that, uh, I don't want to go another 54 years I won't be here, but my son to go another 54 years and see some of the same things, uh, the injustices uh, that happen now, uh, 54 years from now. So I I would be less than a father and a man not to speak out right now. And I have nothing to lose. And, you know, my coaching, I'm on the other side of the mountain. So that's, that's why this is important to me. The white membership of the NBA speaking out is is part of it. You know, I I do feel there's, probably some discomfort with, well, we don't share that experience with black players. We don't share that experience with black coaches. We do not know what it feels like. Um, Are we really qualified to speak out on anything, but the most obvious, but condemning the most obvious stuff that needs to be condemned. Like that's easy to do. Anybody can do that. But I just do feel like this is a majority black league. Right. And I, you know, if we're going to be in this with the players, we're going to be criticizing them for their decisions on the court. We're going right. to be asking for their time to tell us about their lives and their dreams and their families and all that. It's not enough to just imply support. It's got to be part of the beat now. Right. And, and what you just said about anyone throwing nasty stuff at you, um, right. uh, what did someone actually say, teach your kid not to use a phony $20 yeah, bill? One of the comments on one of the sites that don't teach him not to give to And again, if that's capital punishment, their heart is wrong. You know, that, that to even insinuate that to, to come from George, that's why George Floyd got killed. It, even that, that shows their hearts in the wrong place. So, so, so that that's where your E word empathy comes in. No question. Because in the truest form on both sides. Someone saying that mm-hmm. has not done any work. No. Someone no. saying that has not put in any time. No question. Because you're, one of the reasons why your story is – I mean, I, I, it's inspiring. Like, mm-hmm. you're not kidding when you say these white eight-year-olds mm-hmm. who called you the N-word right. and who wanted to fight you for right. being black when you integrated their school are your friends now. All that is is – I met a black person and I realized they're, they're just like me. They're my sports teammate. And, but you're not kidding, right? You're still in touch with these people. This is not a joke. This is not, this is not exaggeration. This is real. This happened. To this day, I'm still friends with a lot of those guys. Some of them have passed away, but to this day, I still am, Zach. And, and again, it says a lot. I think, you know, some of it is, you know, I, under, I understand even more so today, those were the times. But that's what's scary about now, those same, you know, uh, blazing, brazen uh, acts are coming back again. So that's that's the scary part. And I got a text from one of my friends, you know, that read the whole thing. And, you know, he apologized. He really didn't know how badly I felt. Uh, so, again, it, it's good on empathy on both sides. You know, I – I understand those were the times he, it wasn't his fault. He was taught that. And, uh, 
through sports and through getting to know each other, we we all changed. Because I just thought I was going to have to fight my entire third grade or fourth grade or whatever it was. And so, but again, we became friends. And well, and that's why sports. Together. That's why it has to be part of the beat. Because one of the things that is powerful about sports, you had you had a great quote in one of the articles I was reading today, where you said it, it was about going to school. You right. said. I couldn't, we couldn't run away from each other. We couldn't just look at each other and decide to avoid each other because the law had forced us to be in this space together for a long time. And so we had, we could not avoid each other. And that's, that's what like, that, that's the essence of all this. And that's what sports can do because sports not only are you together, sports puts you on a team where you are cooperating and, and, tr- seeking a goal together and that's why this it's all and that's why you see a lot of white athletes have released statements in the last couple of days saying you know i i thought x y and z and then i started joining teams or i didn't have a lot of black friends and then i started joining teams just the simple act of actually getting to know people is incredibly powerful there's a powerful uh you know and my wife showed it to me but it was a powerful clip on the internet where this gentleman with dreadlocks um, starts describing himself and it's on, it's on, on the Instagram. And if you ever want to see it, I've seen it. I've seen it. Unbelievable. He talks about, I fear spiders. I don't like bananas. This is my brother who was a, a white guy. He was evidently adopted. Uh, I don't, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, you know, I like basketball, but I don't love basketball. You know, so it described itself. And if we all just take those, that was like a minute long, a minute and a half long, that that type, that amount of time to get to know each other. You know, you not always don't agree. Zach, you and I, we've had, but we're still friends. We we go back. But that's that's a friendship. Those are things because I know you, you know me. And, but we've taken the time to get to know each other. And that's what this is all about. I've got to get to know my neighbor no matter what color he is. And I think we all have to take that time. And I think, you know, you was mentioning what can the media do around sports. Take the time to get to know Kyle Lowry or uh, DeMar DeRozan or Blake Griffin or whoever personally. You know, the worst thing I think sometimes we do, and I'm guilty of it, hey, you know, what about your shot? Is your shot feeling okay? You know, first thing you do is talk about basketball. Instead of going up, Kyle, how is, how is your son? You know, Blake, how's your kids? Whatever it is, away from basketball and taking the time to get to know uh, different guys you know, other than basketball. And I think that would go a long way from a, from a sporting standpoint and also just a human standpoint. Now more than ever, we have to look out for each other and count on each other. Marathon wants you to know that you can count on them for high-quality, top-tier gas. Marathon gasolines are formulated with STP additives. They keep your vehicle running at peak performance by optimizing fuel economy, removing those ugly deposit buildups, and by reducing emissions. That's good. And right now, you can get $0.05 cents off every gallon every day with Make It Count rewards from Marathon. Plus... You can earn points for additional savings on fuel, airfare, hotels, and more. This is definitely a deal you can count on. It's quick and easy to join. Just download the free Make It Count app or go to makeitcount.com slash radio and start saving today. This offer is valid only at participating Marathon stations. Remember, wherever you need to go, be safe. The people at Marathon are behind you all the way. The first step is so easy but it, it can also feel so hard. So here's a personal example. Right. I had a, had an academic interest in the civil rights movement. And, right. and so I wrote, I wrote in what seems like a life long ago, I was a PhD student. I wrote a master's thesis on essentially on reconstruction and, and, you know, uh, what were called contraband camps during the civil war. Right. Um, I read, I, I can't tell you how many books are sitting at my parents' house because they can't fit in my apartment about SNCC and SCLC and black nationalism in the 60s. Like I had an academic interest in it. Okay, that's fine. That's one thing. Okay. My first journalism job was in Stanford, Connecticut, covering the criminal justice system, the courts, crime, police, and all that. I I made a decision. Is like I this is only interesting to me if I cover it almost from the bottom up. Almost from like, like the judges, the lawyers, like they're not so interesting. So I, I went to, um, the areas that the police would describe to me as the quote unquote most dangerous areas of the city, 
were the quote unquote, the bad people, the quote unquote bad people. And like, sure enough, what do you see when you drive around? You see 15, almost all black kids, kids age 15 to 18, just hanging out. I parked my car, put my press pass around my neck, walked up to them and introduced myself. You know what happened the first day? What's get that? the, get the out of here. You're a cop. Get the out of here. You're a cop. I came back the next day. Are you a cop? Are you sure you're not a cop? I'm not a cop. This press, the press pass says Stanford Advocate newspaper. All right, we well, get the f- out of here, media, whatever. I came back the third day, and they started to realize he's going to keep coming back. And you know what? I can't lie. I was a little bit nervous. I was a little bit nervous. Um, some of those guys at the time had committed crimes, real crimes, not fake, like, you know, got caught with the joint bull crimes, real crimes. Eventually, they started talking to me. Eventually, I became someone that they trusted and they started telling me their life stories. They started introducing me to their parents and that's it. That's all you have to do to have a better understanding of our differences, our efforts to overcome odds, how the system works and doesn't work. All you have to do is have the first conversation. You don't have to do it that way. That's a very unique way of doing it in terms of what my job was, but like just get out of your comfort zone and it w- and that led me to all sorts of different places. Like I started attending prison reentry groups, uh, mostly black guys sitting mm-hmm. around every night, mm-hmm. talking about with with their with their uh, reentry counselors, talking about their struggles getting back into society, how nobody would hire them because they're good people, and just doing stuff like that. I mean, again, it's time, but so many people just lack any kind of empathy and empathy is, is work. It's just work. It's time and it's work. And you have a natural inclination to it maybe, but like, it sounds really dumb, but those interactions, they didn't change my life because I was already sympathetic. I already had an academic interest, but I, they, they definitely changed. They definitely changed something in me for sure. But I'm going to say this, Zach, the one thing that you did, you probably didn't realize you were doing you are actively listening to those kids. And probably in their life, they never had a, a white guy actively listen and really have an interest in them. And that's how you got to know them. They, they allowed themselves to open up. And that's what a lot of times, you know, as a kid, when you see that white guy coming, you think, okay, here's the police. And you have that instant fear, that instant uh, understanding of what a policeman is, or you think, you know, so you, there's fear. But once you listen to their plight of what they're, you know, what they were talking about, you know, they, they accepted you in. But if you went there talking down to them, you got to do this, you got to do that, uh, you probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere with those kids. And I think most of the time, young African American kids in, 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 in tough situations want to be heard. And I, I, I will say it again, that's probably half the, the, the problems in a lot of the you know, the riots and those things now, along with the pandemic, the uh, the unemployment, everything is, is the perfect storm uh, of, uh, of the disenfranchised feeling like nobody's listening. Well, and the, the story, the words that I've always are always in my brain and I always try to tell people about when when white people are skeptical, like, well, why, if this guy's a good person, why is he quote unquote in the system? How did he get in the system? Why, why was he blah, blah, blah. I always tell them the story about interfering with an officer. This is the story. And I was hanging around those kids and I saw it cops. And I would, I, this is going to, well, I, you know, most cops that I met on the beat were good, were good people, but some of them weren't. And one of the games they liked to play was they would drive by these kids because they knew where to find them. It's not hard to find. They mm-hmm. would drive by these kids and they would taunt them. Just playful taunts, right? Playful taunts. Like, what? oh, you got some weed in your pocket. Oh, I know you're up to no good, blah, blah, whatever it was. And they would wait and see, is any of them going to talk back to me? Right. And sometimes the kids would talk back because, you know what, they're 16-year-old kids and you're kind of harassing them. Not kind of. You're harassing them. And they're, they're, they're wise like 16-year-old kids of all races are. If you talked back on the wrong day, and that cop was in a bad mood and he didn't want to hear it. All of a sudden out he comes. And again, this is not all cops, not most cops, some cops out. He comes, you say something else. All of a sudden you're under arrest for interfering with an officer, which back then, I don't know if it exists now in Stanford. That was just the charge to throw at people for anything. And once 
it, then they find a joint in your pocket, which, but it was, who cares? Right. But that, now you're in this and I always, I watched it. I saw it and I thought, well, A, no wonder they're in the system and B, no wonder they distrust all white authority because this is their manifestation of it. This is what they see. And I never saw that. I didn't know that happened growing up. I grew up in the suburbs. I didn't know, like, I, that's not my experience at all. Well, Zach, it also goes back to, you know, the situations why, you know, when the, the attorney general or whoever it was, a prosecutor in Minneapolis said, we don't have enough, we, you, we don't have enough evidence to arrest them. Well, if that had been an African-American guy did the same thing, they'd probably been arrested that night. They wouldn't have to go and get enough, you know, charges or enough evidence against them. They would, they would arrest them and then get the evidence. You know, and I thought, I thought that hit a nerve with a lot of people, you know, thinking, okay, this is a justice system that works for them and it doesn't work for us because, again, if that had been African American or the case down in Georgia where it took them what three months to arrest those guys down there after shooting shooting the young man and probably would still be out free if uh, if the, the video didn't come out. So the the you know here's the justice over in this neighborhood. Here's the justice we're going to use over in this neighborhood, and that's what we got to work to fix uh, at a policy level or you know police training level uh, at some point because. There's two different arms of justice going on, uh, and I think it's playing out in all these cases uh, that's going on right now. Well, and just everything, you know, uh, it's all systemic, right? I mean, that, and that's when the problems become too intimidating to tackle because you realize that all of these things are connected together, and the odds of a, uh, a black kid who's exactly like me, right. okay, born 10 miles the other direction versus me having the same odds of success in life. It's not, it's not it, the difference is incalculable through no fault of that kid because things happen to their parents and their grandparents and, and, and they're starting from a disadvantageous position. And that's when it becomes sort of like, it just feels like everything is impossible and intractable. And that's why I thought Obama's advice was very sound advice. Just start, start with something small, but this is, I mean, your story to me, it, it's just it's inspirational because it just going back to your childhood. It just proves that if you just cross the barrier, just just if you grow up in life thinking you are superior to somebody else because of your skin color and their skin color, I can almost guarantee you you've never even tried. You've never even tried because a you're wrong and b you're probably insecure and pathetic because you're basing your whole worldview around your alleged superiority because of something that is not an accomplishment. It's not an accomplishment to be born white or whatever. Uh, but I can almost guarantee you've never made an effort. And if everyone just made a little bit of an effort, it's not like these aren't huge things. Just make an effort. Yeah, that, that's so true. Because again, you know, you can't help because you were born to your parents. And again, it, it, it you know, and people don't even realize it. Starting out the same starting spot, back, especially back in the 60s, you had a 10 yard lead on me just because of who you were born to. And it's not because, like, as you said, Zach, that you were special or you were different, but you just because of your DNA, you know, you were, you were ahead of me. Now, for me as an African-American young kid, I had to run a little bit faster, work a little bit harder to catch up. And luckily, uh, I was the fifth basketball, African-American basketball player to play at Kentucky, which was another – I didn't put that in the article, but that was – a different time at that time. You see the entire team now, African-American, which is mm -hmm. beautiful. But at that time, we were, you know, we were pioneers. Uh, and so uh, luckily I, I got their attention and, and got a scholarship at the University of Kentucky and, and, and continued the same work ethic and same working hard and the same empathy that I had because even coaching and playing, I went through every county in the state of Kentucky over in the mountains where I was the only African-American in the stands when I was recruiting over there. I'll never forget. I was recruiting Richie Farmer over in Clay County, wow. over in the mountains. I never forget that. And I look around, I'm the only black person in the gym, but I was welcome because I was a Kentucky assistant coach uh, in that time and beautiful people. They treated me like a King, but Probably if I wasn't uh, assistant coach at Kentucky, I would probably have been treated differently. But again, I took that same empathy 
uh, outlook, uh, the feelings I had for mankind. I, I tried to take them throughout my coaching career, playing career, and now continuing as, as a parent. This is why, you know, when affirmative action became somehow a hot button controversial issue, um, mm-hmm. I would always tell people like, I'm, I'm an advocate of diversity for diversity's sake. You know, I don't have to have any other, I don't have to have any other justification for it other than that, because the simple act of being exposed to people from different backgrounds and different cultures, the younger it happens, the better. It can have a life changing effect. Like you don't have to give me any, I don't need the economic arguments, which are all valid. I don't need, I just diversity for diversity's sake. The one thing that you just reminded me as NBA media, one of the things we can do, you brought this up to me several times in, in, in other publications, and I, I think you're right. Black coaches in the NBA still now are much more put into the bucket of motivational, really can relate to the players, really can give a good locker room speech, and not as much into the, oh, wow, look at the adjustments they can make, tactical, tactical. Now, I think there are, there are some, like I think Doc Rivers' out-of-time outplays have gotten – publication mike brown can coach defense alvin gentry can coach offense you've coached but you 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 did you crafted the zone that beat lebron you know what i mean but i I do think that's i do think that's true and one point you made in something i was reading was in your view that starts in college because you're as as kentucky's black coach guess what you got to do go recruit the black players be the guy who can use his oratory skills and cultural ability to convince them to come to kentucky right and i think that that really resonates with me. Exactly. And that's what I try to tell a lot of college coaches. I've spoken to a lot of teams on Zoom and try to tell them, don't pigeonhole yourself into a role uh, as being just a recruiter, uh, you know, because that's a different, terrible world in itself. And that's one thing I give Eddie Sutton credit for and Joe B. Hall credit for. They allowed the assistant coaches to coach practice, to run practice. You know, James Dickey and I and – Leonard Hamilton would all run practice at Kentucky, uh, and and it it allowed us to coach. And uh, he just didn't make us say, okay, go get this player, go recruit that player. And one thing, I took an interest in doing that. I I made myself go talk to Eddie Sutton about what's your philosophy, picked his brain. Uh, I I never forget all the times. I probably was a nuisance to him, but again, (laughs) I want him to know I wanted to learn to be a coach, not just a recruiter to go into Atlanta or Chicago or New York where the black kids are. I want to coach the game of basketball. So I always try to put myself in that position to do that. Uh, And I think that's so important today in the NBA uh, is to be able to demonstrate, okay, yeah, you can relate to players, you can motivate players, but do you know the X and O's? And and I, I mentioned that to you the other day, and it's so true. It's true in, in football. It's true almost in every sport. And it's a subtle nuance where he's a communicator. You know, Mike Tomlin at Pittsburgh, he's won champion. He's won everywhere he's been, but he's still known as a player's coach where he knows as much X and O's and as anything, and they, like all of us, we all delegate offense, defense, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's our philosophy they're incorporating with the players. And uh, so I think that's a subtle you know, nuance that I think the media, sometimes we're guilty of it as coaches, of, of pigeonhole got, pigeonholing guys into certain areas. But I, that's one area I think we can all do a better job of is – He's a good coach. Just he's a good coach. He knows how to coach. And that's what I want to do to help fellow basketball coaches is to say, you know, that guy's a good coach. That's a well-coached team, whether it's black, white, or green. That way, you know, we can pr- promote coaches, coaching uh, as much as anything else. It's almost a more malignant version of the um, the thing that still you see in, in sports media sometimes where – uh, the black players are athletic and the white players are scrappy and hardworking That's because nice. the coaching, the coaching uh, offshoot of it gets into tactical stuff, which gets into intellect. And I, and, and so it's almost more malignant to me. And I know year, years ago, probably through talking to you, honestly, I, whenever I start writing about a coach or talking about a coach and I feel myself putting them in a bucket, I stop and I think, is this fair? Right. what does he do outside this bucket that maybe I'm not writing about? And it's, it, it doesn't have to be a race thing either. So mm-hmm. on, on the jump, on the jump last week, mm-hmm. Rachel asked us who sh- who's a better fit for the Knicks, mm-hmm. Tom Thibodeau or Kenny Atkinson. Right. And you immediately find yourself thinking, 
well, one guy can win with is a veteran win now guy, and one guy's a development guy. And I think if I were Kenny Atkinson, if I heard the words player development one more time, I might throw something against the wall. Mm-hmm. And and all the young coaches and get tagged with that. And until you win, it never goes away because Kenny Atkinson might be ready for a great, might be a great playoff coach right now, might be a great conference finals coach right now, but he's been tagged with this player development moniker that, you know, Spo is one of the guys that got to grow out of it, right? The young coach who who grows out of it. But if I were, so I, I, I thought I, I said on TV, I hope Kenny gets a chance to coach a good team someday because you see all these player development coaches they coach, coach, coach. The team gets pretty good. They get fired, and someone else gets brought in, and and it's it's a cousin of what we're talking about. But I, but you let me, let me say this, Zach. One thing you said about and you that that is exactly what that hits on. You know, we'll talk about Kenny in a second, but with the African American coaches, and it, it attacks the African Americans intellect. You know, you're not smart enough to coach offense. You're not smart enough to coach defense. You're not smart enough to coach the analytical game or adapt to it. And that's, you know, that's what it subtly says in a roundabout way. And if you're Mike Tomlin, he's been there, what, 13, 14 years. He's won every year. And and unfortunately, they've run against the Patriots every year. But, uh, again, it, I cringe because, I, I, you know, we have the same issue in the NBA. And that's that's something of, of, of – I think the more, like you said, the more you win, the more you, you, uh, you know – build a championship team, the, the more you get out of that. But I think that helped. But, again, like you said, Kenny Atkinson is more than a developmental coach. He's an excellent coach. Uh, he knows his X and O's. Uh, he's just not just a one-dimensional coach. And so, I, again, it's a, a reverse stereotype, so to speak. Um, that, these are all that, – that's – I'm glad we hit on that because that's one simple thing the media can do is, like, when you find yourself writing – something that feels cliche Mm -hmm. step back for a second because we're all going to be guilty of it everyone me included everyone we're all going to be guilty of it step back for a second and think was that fair to that person um no matter what coach this is um i'm trying to think if there's anything we didn't hit is it was there something we didn't hit that you wanted to talk about uh that we we hit on everything and believe me zach i i this you're i've always respected you but for you to attack this issue, not only with me, but continue to uh, your level of respect with me. And I, I'm, I know with other players around the league, just shot off. Because, again, uh, until everybody goes at it together and, and not, not in a, a mean-spirited way and combative way, just doing what's right, saying what's right, fighting for what's right in your own way, uh, I think we can make a, a dent into – the issues of today, not just in sports, but the average guy walking down the street, your average kid that's walking down the street. And I think it takes people like yourself, uh, the platform of ESPN, uh, the platform of the NBA that I'm humble and blessed to have an opportunity. And that's what we talked about as NBA coaches. And that's the same message I'm going to give to my players is we have a platform. We've been blessed. Let's use it in the right way, not just once all the cameras go away from Minneapolis. Uh, that's that's going to be the challenge when they stop, when something else comes along, uh, you know, let's go to the new thing. No, let's continue to beat the drum of change, of policy, try to touch people's hearts and minds and have empathy for whoever we come in contact with that doesn't look like us. You know, we don't know or record. It's 4.30 p.m. on Monday. We don't know what tonight's going to bring or tomorrow night or this week. I'm too young and not informed enough to know if this really is different, if this if this is going to be more long-lasting and different. I'm, I'm intrigued to hear that you feel that it's, it feels different. But I'm, I, I, I'm going to choose to, you know, you can see the things burning on TV and the police, you know, running over, trying to drive over protesters and get angry about it and people should be angry about it. But I, I – my hope is that if this stuff keeps happening, if these protests keep happening, I hope we in three or four days or even now we feel a little bit of hope because the only, the only path forward, as you just said, is it, that's positive is you just, we can't just drop it. It can't be dropped. And it, and if, if that means we have to endure a lot of nights that 
you know, where things where where people spotlight the wrong things, where uh, people spotlight violence instead of what the underlying cause of the violence is. I guess that's the price to pay, but I, I, I'm choosing to watch this with, with some hope. And I, and I hope, you know, we'll, we'll see what the next few nights bring, right? Just what you said. Let's don't get it twisted with the looting, which is terrible, the violence from what the real root problem is that ignited all that, you know, and that's, that's my, my fear of what's going on, which is bad because again, uh, we're tearing up a lot of the inner city black owned bit small businesses that, are, that those communities depend on and so let's let's don't let that but let's let's attack the real problems that's going on uh coach thank you for your time uh and good luck uh with the pistons whatever the rest of the season or not season looks like for you good luck next season uh please stay safe and and keep your family safe and keep your loved ones safe thanks for your time thank you zach thank you so much